Hello there, everyone around the world. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the SNEA Networking Storage Forum, or NSF, webinar on a SAN overview, how fiber channel hosts and targets really communicate. So we've got a great webcast for you today. We're going to cover in good depth how fiber channel hosts find each other and connect and authenticate and start their communication and the data transfers. So let me go ahead and start out with who our presenters are. I'm John Kim. I'm not actually presenting any real content, but I'm your moderator today and also chair of the Networking Storage Forum at SNEA. We have Ed Mazurek, who's Customer Experience Technical Leader or CX Technical Leader at Cisco. And we have AJ Casamento, Principal R&D Engineer at Broadcom. Both of these gentlemen are fiber channel experts and ready to help show you or help explain exactly how the fiber channel protocol works. They'll also be happy to take your questions. So I'll get more, say more about that in just a minute. First, a quick word about SNEA. SNEA is an industry organization focused on storage networking and storage. Over 180 organizations, over 2,500 contributing members, and over 50,000 total members, including end users, vendors, consultants, integrators, uh, resellers, and influencers and analysts. You can learn more about SNEA on the technical side at snea.org slash technical or follow us on Twitter at SNEA. In the networking storage forum, we cover Ethernet, fiber channel, and InfiniBand as connectivity technologies. We cover protocols like iSCSI, NVMe over fabrics, NFF, sorry, NFS, and SMB. We also cover storage solutions and architectures such as virtualized storage, hyperconverged infrastructure, software-defined storage, and so forth, as well as different storage protocols and storage security or data security. A quick legal notice mandated by our attorneys. This material, can, the material is copyrighted by SNEA unless otherwise noted. Any member company of SNEA may use this material as long as you reproduce these slides without modification and acknowledge SNEA as the source. This is a SNEA project and neither the author nor any of the presenters are attorneys. Nothing in this presentation should be construed as or is intended to be legal advice or opinion of counsel. Okay, there, this presentation may include personal opinions and we intend it to be as accurate and unbiased as possible, but we do not guarantee or warranty uh, this information anyway, and we're not responsible for any damages relying out of your use or reliance on this information. Okay, let me hand this over to uh, Ed now. Oh, actually, sorry, Ed. Let me give a quick note about questions. We do ask you to take, bring all your questions uh, and ask them using the questions feature, and we will see those and have the presenters ask, answer those questions as much as time allows. If we can't get to all the questions, we will answer the rest of them in a blog that we publish shortly after this webcast. At the end of the webcast, we ask you to give us a rating and provide comments as well. With that said, uh, please you know, do bring your questions. And Ed, let me turn it over to you for you and AJ to take it away. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, hey, everyone. This is Ed Mazurek. Uh, again, I'm with Cisco. And we're gonna, AJ and I are going to give you a kind of beginning to end understanding of how hosts and targets communicate. We're, in, we're initially going to talk about the fiber channel stack and how links initialize. Then we're going to talk about the couple of port types. There's many other ones, but we're going to concentrate on the ones that are important. And we're going to talk about buffer to buffer credit flow control, which is uh, very important in the fiber channel world. We'll then go into logins and some of the flows that happened. Uh, and then eventually we'll get to the end where we'll talk about the actual IO that happens. So this is our agenda for today. And Go ahead, AJ, take it away. Thanks very much, Ed. And again, welcome, folks. Let's talk a little bit about the Fiber Channel stack. It may surprise many of you because I think pretty much everybody associates um, SCSI with Fiber Channel or Fiber Channel with SCSI, depending on which way you look at it. But Fiber Channel as a protocol has been around for quite some period of time. Um, and so one of the things that may surprise you is there's actually multiple protocols, upper layer protocols that run on top of um, fiber channel as a as a fabric and as a as a network infrastructure, and so when you when you look at the stack, you know it's not it's it's not an OSI stack as such, but when you look at the fiber channel stack, right? FC zero is is pretty much the transceiver level, right? So we, where we deal with 
with the speeds um, that we're that we're uh, current rating and current generations for, for our technology are at 64 gigabit in serial, 256 gig in parallel. Um, most of the volume platforms in in, in both of, in, in the market today are in the 30 gig space. 64 gig is is a fairly early uh, entry um, at at this stage, just a, just about a year now. Um, at FC one layer, we have encode decode, right? So so this is started off as the AP 10B encode decode. By the way. Um, you know, if you go back and you look at the, the Ethernet standards, Ethernet um, at the gigabit layers uh, also started off with the AB 10B code decode and you now 6466. And, you know, moving forward, um, we're going up to the, the option of 256, 257 bit uh, encode decode. So, so uh, data integrity, right? And link control protocol, right? This is, this is the layer that that gets handled at. So think of it that way. FC2 is framing and flow control, um, classes of service that are that are supported, right? So um, fiber channel um, deals in frames. Multiple frames make up a sequence. Multiple sequences make up an exchange. So a simple way to sort of think about it uh, that hopefully won't make um, too many people cringe is word, sentence, paragraph, okay, um, in terms of, of how the data is, is, is being handled. But fiber channel all at the FC3 layer brings in common fabric services, so name services, zoning services, application management, and so on. These are all things that um, that, that exist there. Um, at the FC4 layer, we deal with the actual protocols that we're that we're uh, that we're running. So FCP or fiber channel protocol, which is serial SCSI three um, on on fiber channel, um, the single byte command code set. Um, um, runs on top of FCSB6, so that's the mainframe or FICON uh, environments. And now, um, fairly recently, within the last couple of years, the FC NVMe2, so the NVMe protocol running over um, uh, Fiber Channel. RFC 4338 is where IP, so surprisingly enough, many of you may not have realized that IP actually runs on Fiber Channel as well. Um, that's in that's something that we uh, we see in use in um, in the aero industry, um, uh, in, in particular with some of the military um, that that uh, that are out there, so um, basically think of it as um, you know a network protocol that supports multiple upper layer protocols, um, very similar to, to what you would what you would expect. Um, frame format, so the fiber channel frame format, right? Starter starter frame header payload. Um, CRC for for data integrity and then end of frame marker, right? And so the payload. Um, up to uh, um, 2112 bytes of, uh, of payload. So, you know, we, we typically talk about it as a 2K payload uh, in, the, in the environment. But one of the things that's a little different here um, is that CPU interrupts um, happen basically at uh, generally at sequence boundaries as opposed to at frame, at frame boundaries. And so where some protocols may on every packet um, be, a, be asserting an interrupt, right? Um, to the, to the CPU, we tend to do it um, at, at sequence boundaries. Additionally, um, one of the things that's also true about the way Fiber Channel works is that Fiber Channel is a zero copy uh, environment. And so we write uh, directly to the application um, memory location. So if we get into the header, um, basically where, where, um, where you're seeing this, the important things to pay attention to here um, are the SID DID element, right? So the source uh, source ID destination ID. Obviously, um, when you when you're looking at this, it, it's pretty typical to most networking uh, protocols. Um, the RCTL is is the is the routing um, uh, region address region, but the the destination ID is going to be from the host. If we look at it from the host standpoint, from the host to the target. So destination ID is the target. SID would be the host. The return traffic, obviously. Uh, would be the reverse of that. So the destination ID from the from the target or storage uh, element back would be the would be the host um, definition, right? Um, and then the the source ID would be the the storage returning it. You'll notice the sequence ID um, uh, in there as well. And so sequence ID deals uh, deals with um, and sequence count deals with the um, the orientation or the the, the numbering of the, of the particular frame within the sequence, and so you remember that I that I mentioned to you that that multiple frames make up a sequence. So we know um, specifically the the sequence 
uh, through, through the sequence ID and the sequence count, we know the orientation of that frame in the fiber channel sequence. Okay, so you can think of that sort of similar to um, a TCP uh, environment where the, the TCP algorithm knows um, what, the, what the packet sequence is, right, and can reorient um, the environment. A little different for us um, in, the, in the sense that fiber channel is a buffer-to-buffer -buffer credit mechanism, which, is, which Ed is gonna talk about, so the flow control is a little different. We don't forward data that, 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 um, that we don't know there's, there's space to take. The OXID, RXID, that's the exchange ID. So the so OXID from our side would be the, the host sending uh, ID, right? And then um, the RXID would be the, the receiver um, exchange back uh, back to us. And so that's probably about as deep into the header as, as um, we need to go for today's conversation. And with that, I'm going to put it back to Ed for the, uh, oh, sorry, no, uh, link initialization is still made. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that, Ed, um, for that that minor panic. So um, one of the first things that happens in the link initialization is the speed negotiation. We've got a variety of speeds currently live in, in Fiber Channel. As, as you saw from the original uh, stack, we started, actually Fiber Channel started all the way back to, to quarter speed, so 255 megabit Fiber Channel. For most intents and purposes today, uh, we're dealing with um, a few legacy 4 gig platforms, but 8 gig, 16 gig, 32 gig, and 64 gig um, fiber channel platforms out there in, in, in market. So speed negotiation becomes the first uh, element of this, as well as transmitter training. So forward error correction is an overhead that you're going to see in many networks, um, in, not, just, not just in fiber channel, but in many networks. As speeds go up and, and transmission rates go up, um, you're going to, to see, um, you know, this, this um, this forward error correction in place um, as part of the data integrity um, level, and so there is there is an overhead associated with this, but but basically it it it, uh, it helps with the integrity of, of the of the transfer. Um, okay. and, and quick, so one quick question: So is are all fiber channel speeds using this forward error correction, or just the newest fastest speeds, or is it an no, so option? So that's so that's that's a that's a, that's a good uh, a good question, John. Thank you. Um, so in point of fact, the the previous slower generations of fiber channel did not use uh, forward error correction. It wasn't it wasn't really necessary. Um, we started seeing uh, forward error correction in the 32 gig um, speed speed rates, but moving forward, you're going to see it in in all of the the newer speeds. So it, there's just no there's no there's no there's no way that you could do this without without having forward error correction uh, in the environment. By the way, to my understanding, I believe that's also true um, once you start getting into longer distances for say like 20 gig Ethernet and so on. I think they're they're also um, looking uh, using uh, forward error correction over over there as well. So and, the, and yeah, AJ, the, I'll, I'll just jump in here and say I believe that in 32 gig and 64 gig it's mandatory as part of the protocol. You can't turn it off, but in 16 gig it is optional. And it can be turned on if 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 both ends agree to do it. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Um, and so yeah, that's it's it is it is mandatory now in, in the higher speeds. There's just, there's there's no way to really make things work cleanly um, without. Um, in the handshakes that are that are that are going um, back and forth, right? There's there's um, the idea of this non-operational sequence. Um, the return is an, is is an offline sequence, so this is the, the initial um, scenario for uh, for bringing up the link um, the link reset. Um, we always send traffic, and so this is a little a little a little different, right? So um, idles or or ARBs um, can also be used, but idles are are always in play um, until data is actually being being sent. And so the link the link is always live. We're always uh, we're always in constant. Um, Constant sequence. So, in, in point of fact, loss of light on the link is one of the errors that would that would indicate that there's a that there's a, there's an issue. So, if there's ever um, a, a loss of light or a loss of signal on the on the link, that's a that's an immediate indication that there's a, there's a problem in the, in the link. So, idles are are a constant for us, um, which is a little different than than uh, than some than some networks. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Ed for the port place. Okay. Thanks, AJ. So let's talk about uh, a typical small topology in a fiber channel SAN. We have really just 
two node types or two two uh, types that we have of port types inside of the SAN itself. These could be contained in one switch or you can have multiple switches. There are other types that we don't really need to talk about because they're not as popular, but typically we're going to have the N port, the F port, and the E port. So the N port describes an N device, and you can see there uh, either a host or a target, they would be an N port from their perspective. They would attach to an F port on a switch. So an N port talks to an F port or a fabric port. And then if you are interconnecting switches to build a multi-switch SAN, uh, which you don't have to do, you can just have single switch SANs, but if you want to have multiple uh, switches interconnected, then those are called E ports or expansion ports. And the links between them are called inter-switch links or ISLs. And these, uh, basically the three ports make up, uh, you can build a SAN of almost any size that you would like using these three port types. And how is a port type determined? Well, it can be statically configured to be on the first upper upper right-hand corner, you'll see that the host target ports are always end ports, they're always node ports. But on the switches side, switches are smart enough to either figure out the, what it's connected to, or if it's manually configured, it would know just from the configuration. So in the top right hand corner, you see that once the link initialization goes on, the, if the switch is configured uh, as an F port, then it's gonna sit there and wait for a fabric login, otherwise known as a floggy. And it's just gonna sit there and wait for the end port to send that in. And once it gets that, it's gonna process that floggy, allocate uh, the layer three address called the FCID, and it's gonna send back the accept to that floggy with that FCID. Now, if the switch is, you know, uh, allows to be an automatic mode or you know, mode auto, then that switch port is gonna basically wait, it's gonna uh, initialize the link and then it's going to send out this thing called an exchange link parameters, which is the first step in, in initializing an ISL if it was an ePort. So the, the way this works is if it, if it hears back another ELP, then it's going to initialize an ePort. But if it hears back a floggy, so if the end port you know, basically ignores the ELP and sends its own floggy in, then at this point in time, the switch comes around and says, okay, I, 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 got the, I got the memo. This port is now going to be an F port and not an E port. So we have an automatic mechanism, which many ports are configured just for simplicity, but, uh, but you can configure it as well if you want to lock it down. Okay, go ahead, uh, AJ, with well-known services. Thanks, Ed. So our channel addressing... Um, uses a, a three bright layer of, of addresses for end port IDs or private channel, private channel IDs. And these are somewhat anal analogous to IP addresses, right? And so, you know, obviously um, there's hardware level addresses, which is port worldwide names that, that, that Ed was describing. And then there's, there's um, the fabric addresses, which are, which are the, um, the equivalent of IP addresses, right? The first byte of which is the domain ID of the switch. And so you can sort of think of that as an IP subnet uh, comparison, right? So for the, for the well-known addresses, so these are addresses that every device driver would expect to see. Um, you can think of it sort of, sort of like um, community services. You know, you, 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 you've got a number for the police department, you've got a number for, for the ambulance and so on down, down the list, right? So um, the destination for the floggy um, address, right? The destination for the fabric controller, which is the, the ELP destination, the fiber, fiber channel name server. So one of the things that, that's different about fiber channel, there are, there are a number of things different about fiber channel, but one of the things different about fiber channel is we have a name service resident in the fabric. And so all of the switches in the fabric run a copy of the name service. So all the switches are, are intimately aware of the location of every device um, in, the, in the fabric, right? Then you also have the, the fiber channel management um, server, right? So those are, those are the, the sort of short list of uh, of addresses, the management server is where, where you would, would get um, additional um, additional data. But to, to Ed's point, when you go through the login, the end port has to um, log in to the fabric to obtain its IP address, to, to obtain its, its fabric address. Um, that fabric login in, in, in 
which, which occurs via the, the floggy exchange that he was talking about. So if the ELP hits, hits an, an end port or a node port, whether it's a host or a storage element, right, it's going to ignore the ELP. It's, not, it's going to say, I don't know what you mean by the exchange link parameters. Um, I just want to get a fabric login. I need my, I need my address to be able to talk to uh, storage. And so that floggy is, is going to have very specific device parameters that it's, that it's going to notify the, 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 the switch about. The F-port server is going to, or, or sorry, uh, is going to allocate that, that address uh, for within its domain and, and send the accept back, right? And the import now has a fabric address that it can communicate to other well-known addresses and end devices. Now, the, the communication to end devices um, is, is going to be a little bit different here, uh, once that within fiber channel, we have this concept of zones, okay? And so zoning in fiber channel, you can sort of think of as being equivalent to uh, VLANs in Ethernet. And, and, you know, to some degree, with some similar services in the sense that, you know, VLANs were originally sort of, I, I, I want to get notifications, but I don't need to see the notifications for everybody in the world. I just want to see the stuff that's important to me, right? And so you, you kind of restrict that, that chattiness, right? Well, zoning has a number of functions, one of which is security. So basically, you can only see elements within your own zone, okay? Um, and that has the benefit of, you know, you don't need to know about the noisy neighbor next door. Right? That, that's stuff that you don't necessarily want to know about. Uh, but also, they can't see you, and they can't talk to you, and they can't talk to um, your, your storage or your data. Right? And so a name service response is, is going to be limited to the view that, that the, the platform is able to see for zoning. But let's, let's Actually, let me ask a quick uh, question about that. Sure. So uh, if you're saying that, actually, first let me comment. So someone asked if this presentation is being recorded. Yes, all our webinars are recorded and will be available uh, afterward. You can watch it in Bright Talk or later it'll be available, probably available on the SNEO YouTube channel. Uh, and, uh, and that'll be the recording of the audio with the slides. Okay, and then back to this, the previous slide about the, the floggies. And so I keep thinking froggies, but uh, if you have fiber channel zoning in place, does that block, uh, so you're saying that blocks who is notified by, who can receive those floggy uh, notifications? Um, so there, is, there are mechanisms where, where you, can, you can explicitly, um, you can explicitly say that a, a particular world port worldwide name can only get a, a floggy on, on a specific port within the fabric. So but that's, you know, that's, that, there, there is that um, capability to do, but that's not actually the zoning, the zoning environment. The zoning environment basically um, sets up what devices are allowed to communicate to each other based, based on generally their, their worldwide names, right? And so, and so then the, the, those, um, those devices, and, and best practices early on were single initiator, single target zones. And so part of the rationale behind that, you know, if you go back far enough in time, John, um, and, and I, with apologies to the early days of, uh, or earlier days of Microsoft, but when Microsoft first taught Windows to walk a network topology, you know, it was, a, it was effectively, you know, a very acquisitive little operating system. And so any storage element that it could see it, it automatically assumed belonged to it, right? And it would do interesting things like write a volume label on it, right? And if you were a Unix volume and all of a sudden you got overwritten with a Windows volume label, your Unix server just lost. And so shared apologies became, you know, a little bit more, more dicey and in need of control. And so there's the, the zoning mechanism of single initiator, single target zoning was sort of best practice for a number of years. There's augmentations to that now where you can create um, broader definitions for it. But basically, it's a constraint for which devices in the fabric can see which devices. The fabric login is, is almost always going to occur, um, and zoning doesn't, doesn't in fact, um, stop that. Got it. Okay, yeah, I, mis I, I, I uh, misconstrued the term. So you can still lock into the fabric, but then zoning limits which devices can talk to which other devices. Right, right. Because, because you, don't, you don't want every device to see every other device. You know, in, in particular, um, in, these, in, these in, in these environments, you know, the challenge that you get into is we're talking about, about system data, 
right? And and application data. And so it's it's you, you don't want to be able to eavesdrop to it. You don't want to be able to see it. And so the the single initiator, single target um, zoning was was kind of the, the scenario that. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, so I want to go on because I don't want to burn too much time, but let me ask uh, both uh, Ed and AJ to try turning off your cameras if you can from your presenter screen because uh, I just realized that uh, if your cameras are transmitting a video, that might consume extra bandwidth. So let's all try switching off our, our cameras and then continue. Okay. Um, sorry, sorry about that. Um, let, me, let me drop back and see if I can... Um, should be at the top of the screen. Uh, there should be a microphone icon, a camera icon, and a settings icon. And in, in theory. And, uh, I actually can't switch off my camera, but that's okay. If you can't, that's all right. I, Just go I on. Can't, I can't either. That that seems to be to be grayed out on mine. Sorry about that. So no, no problem. Well, go go on, please. You're, you're stuck. You're stuck seeing my smiling face again. So okay. Um, so the fiber channel fabric controller is responsible for, for fabric operations. It handles switch to switch or F class traffic, right? Which is which is how switches exchange data um, with each other about what is in the fabric. It's how the it's how um, the name server gets gets updated because obviously as a new device logs into one switch, that name service name server update needs to be um, extended to to everybody so that everybody knows where it is. But, and part of the way that happens is through something called registered state change notifications or RSCNs. One of the really nice things that happens in Fiber Channel is you register for state change notifications, but state change notifications, so an individual device will, will say, yes, I wanna be told about state change, right? So that's the state change re uh, registration. Um, but it only gets told about state change um, within its zone. So again, if I'm if I'm you know an ESX server over here, um, and there's an AIX server um, you know in the in the same fabric, the ESX server doesn't necessarily want to know about changes for the AIX server, um, and so in its zone, which is just the ESX server through the fabric to its storage element, it will only be told about changes within its within its own zone, right? And so that's registered state change notification is how you find out that changes are occurring but state change notification will be limited to just to just the zone. So the state change um, registration, the, the, the request will be sent to the switch and the switch will res respond back and say, yep, okay, you're subscribed. Um, I will notify you to changes um, that occur within your zone. When devices enter or leave, those state change notifications get sent as well. So um, once once the, the link comes up and the storage, the storage is there, or if there's some other uh, element being added in. So for example, um, you decide that, that you've got um, a need for expanding the storage or maybe load balancing storage requests across multiple ports in an array, you might add an additional port um, to, that, to that storage array to the same zone. So that same server could see now dual ports um, within that same storage array and want to be able to load balance traffic across. And so that will show up as a, as a new storage array element just entered the fabric, right? And be sent to that host and that host can respond back and say, hey, okay, I've got a, I've got a new friend to talk to. I've got an address that I, that I can dial up and uh, engage. And so it, it, can, it can then talk to, um, to that device. Fiber Channel also allows a number of arbitrary topologies and Fiber Channel has a, a, a protocol uh, for routing, um, or if we have any of our UK friends on the, on the phone routing, um, you know, fabric shortest path first, right? And you can sort of think of this as as similar to some of the Ethernet uh, routing algorithms that, that exist as well. In theory, the address range allows up to 239 connected switches. I've never seen a fabric of that size. I, I think the maximum fabric size I've ever individually encountered um, was 80 uh, some, odd, some odd switches in a, in a, in a single fabric. But Pretty typical topologies can be a uh, four edge, where uh, similar to a spine leaf architecture that you might think about in, um, in Ethernet, um, or um, a, uh, a core edge where you've got multiple cores, right? Or full mesh, where all the switches are interconnected to each other. So full mesh topologies tend to be a little bit smaller um, in, in their environments, um, just, just because customers tend to, um, Tend to tend to, to go more to the spine leaf or core edge 
um, sort of sort of scenarios. That's a that's a pretty common thing. Something that's a little different about Fiber Channel, as I mentioned to you before, the fabric and the name service know intimately all of the links. And so the thing that's a little different about this is if a link gets lost, right? You don't go through a reconvergence, right? There's 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 no there's no similar equivalent to what to what goes on in Ethernet where the where the fabrics are going to go off and 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 go through some some interesting gyration. If there is a known good alternate path between the initiator and the target still live, the system will automatically uh, reroute to that. And so there's there's no there's no massive um, impact to the to the fabric if a if a link gets lost between between switches. Um, and so that's that's a, a pretty significant difference, I think, in, in terms of uh, in terms of topologies. But we support, you know, a number of topologies. And I think one of the other things that I would also say um, is that the the topology configurations are much more automated. And so you could literally take, you know, a dozen switches uh, out of boxes, throw them into racks, cable them together and power them on. And the fiber channel fabric will automatically configure. You don't go, there's no hundreds of, of commands on every port to, to prevent loop creations or any of the rest of that um, that might happen in other, in other technologies or other topologies. The fiber channel fabric will configure, it will come up, it will be live, and it will begin uh, handling logins and creating the, the, the name service registry and so on, right? So all of that will happen pretty much automatically. Um, and with that, I'm gonna step it back to, to Ed for the fiber channel flow control. Okay, thanks, AJ. Yeah, and I'll just uh, mention that I'm in the support business, and I tell you, I hardly ever have problems with our routing protocol, FSPF. It's uh, you, you could take those switches that AJ talked about, you can connect them up 100 different ways, and the host and targets could be anywhere distributed in the fabric, and it would just all work without any tweaking or other uh, other configurations. So it is pretty pretty nice. Most SAN people are barely aware that there's a underlying layer three routing protocol running in the SAN. So let's talk about uh, flow control. Flow control is a huge uh, topic and we're just gonna touch it here. Uh, all, uh, all communication protocols really implement some form of flow control, uh, whether it's uh, you know in priority flow control and FCOE or in, um, you know, Rocky V2, or it's windowing flow, flow call pacing, or whatever you want to call it, they all implement because you have to basically equalize the data entering the network with the data exiting the network. And within the network, there are, you know, almost an infinite amount of possibilities of what what devices are connected, how they're connected, and how they're performing. So if, if more data, for example, enters the network, then the network can process, then packet drops result or frame drops result and in the fiber channel world that is a huge problem because the the upper layer protocols really expect 100 percent of the packets or the frames to be uh, delivered in in the really in the order that they were sent so so in in general we don't have packet drops in the fiber channel world unless there's serious problems. And flow control, the fiber channel flow control mechanism called buffer to buffer credit flow control uh, really is what, what achieves that. So buffer to buffer credit flow control really works by exchanging the each side of the link. It's a link hop by hop uh, link level protocol exchanges a number of receive buffers available on each side of the link. So these are physical receive buffers that can hold a, a whole frame regardless of size. And uh, each side maintains the knowledge of the number of available receive buffers the adjacent side of the link has. And a new frame is only transmitted to the uh, other side when the transmitting side knows that the receiving side has a buffer available. So how does that work? Well, Initially, I'll take a host of a target, but the same kind of thing happens switch to switch on e-ports with ISLs. But the uh, the host will send in this floggy, this fabric login, and in one of the parameters inside of that is how many buffer to buffer credits it has or how many buffer locations it has. It really means the same thing. And the switch will then take this number, record it, and it will send back its own accept to that floggy, and it gives its number. In this case, these are just two numbers I picked out of the air. We have 32 coming in from the host or target, and we have 64 coming from the switch. These numbers do not have to match, 
and each side records what the other side is or the other side has told it that it has. Now, something that you might hear occasionally is about how the buffer to buffer credits have been negotiated. Well, let me just say that there's really no negotiation here. The host or target transmits how many it, it has and the switch transmit how many it has and they don't have to match. Now, if there's some problem with that number for some reason, that would be a really rare case then the link would just fail. Uh, but there is no coming back and say, hey, I need more or I need less or anything like that. So, but uh, this is the basis of it. Each side tells the other side how many buffer locations they have. And then, then each side will, will be keeping track of that based upon the number of frames sent and what's known as the credits that are giving it. So how does that work? So the transmit side transmits a frame if the remaining credit, so it's keeping track of the remaining credits is, is greater than one. It, it decrements it and then it transmits the frame. If the frame remaining credits is, happen to be zero at that time, then that frame waits. The receiving side uh, receives the frame and processes it. And in this case, since it's a switch, it's going to basically route that packet to the egress port, wherever it's got to go in that in that switch, and then it's going to send back an already, which is a buffer to buffer credit, and that already is going to signify to the host or target on the left that that buffer location is now free, and the receiving side of that already is going to increment its remaining credits again by one. Now, some important concepts on this is that the already is not an acknowledgement. Uh, and you don't, if there are uh, several frames outstanding from the host or the target to the switch, when the already comes in, you don't really know which of those frames has been uh, switched to its egress port. All you know is a buffer location has been, in, has been freed and now you increment your credits by one. And if you were at zero, any waiting frames could be transmitted. And if you're not at zero, you've just incremented your credits uh, anticipating another frame coming in. So, so the buffer buffer credit uh, mechanism is a very controlled mechanism such that the, the frames are only really transmitted to the other side of the link when it's known that the other side of the link can has buffer locations to hold it. And because of that, there are no frames dropped in that, uh, in that transmission. Now, this is all uh, well and good, but what can happen is when you're equalizing the traffic, let's suppose we have a you know, 16 gig target on the right and the host is a 32 gig um, target on the left. And these are just random examples. It could be anything. Or there could be, you know, five switches in the middle along the way. So if there was four credits exchanged, let's say between the host and the switch, then what this shows is that um, if the host sends two frames, gets an already back, sends two more frames and gets an already back, it it um, and then it has two more credits to send. And at that point in time, once it sends these last two frames, it's going to have to wait for an already. And it's basically waiting for the switch to get be able to transmit frames over to the target because the target's running at half speed. So this mechanism is going to equalize the traffic that the host sends to the, tar the traffic that the switch can transmit to the target. So the slowest, it might be because of different link speeds, like in this example, it could be because of internal congestion. There could be some problem either on the target or the host side or something where it's not able to receive frames uh, very quickly. It could, uh, it also could be that, you know, this is a very simple example with one host and one target, but typically a host might be zoned with eight targets. And sometimes all eight targets might be transmitting to that same host at the same time. And this mechanism is going, to, is going to ensure that there's no packet loss, but it might result in what we call back pressure to the targets actually transmitting the frames because if, if the host itself is overwhelmed or the link itself is overwhelmed, then any additional frames that we would we want to receive from the target we might have to wait for a little while until there is buffer locations that are available and freed up. 
and again, the ISLs, uh, if there are multiple switches in the path and there are ISLs there, depending upon the configuration of the ISLs, the number of devices you're using them and stuff, there can be congestion or overutilization on there. This is a really huge topic, uh, the congestion in fiber channel networks. Um, and uh, there's probably a bunch of information out there available out on the web for this. This is I'm just touching the touching the the surface of it here, but it is a quite a extensive topic to uh, and and really fascinating the kind of problems that that you can get into with this. But at the same time, this is ensuring that the frames that are received by the fabric, the SAN, are able to be successfully delivered to where they have to go. Yeah, and I, if I could just jump in, not not sure. to throw database administrators under the bus, um, but <laughs> no, we of, wouldn't want to do that. No, no, never, never, never. You know, always polite to them. But but one of the scenarios that you were just describing that springs right to my head is database administrators who think that that striping read requests across multiple storage ports so that data is always waiting for their database and their database is never waiting for data. Don't take into account the idea that their host may not be able to consume it fast enough. And they're actually creating the very back pressure you're describing, right? Yeah, and they yeah absolutely. Get, yep. And they would actually get better, better performance and and faster exchange completion times if if they would, um, you know, basically uh, pace themselves as a, as opposed to being the greedy child at the table. Sorry. Right, right. The the host may not be able to accept it because it's internally only able to process at a certain rate, but it may be that the link itself isn't able to even transmit it, even if the host is able to transmit or to receive at a higher rate. So there are a couple of different problems that result in there, but some of this is design. Uh, yes, yeah, some of this is design and and best some best practices once you roll them out you will find that the number of problems that result as you know from congestion type issues can be you know can be reduced yep. okay so uh, i think go ahead aj you uh all right so host and target host and target logins so you know we're, we're going to step this and it's, it's going to seem a little a little, uh, a little simplistic maybe even a touch on it but the host is initially going to um, make make its its first uh, floggy request out uh, out to um, actually that should be the, the the switch on that side um, that that label should not be storage that's that's the follow on piece um, the accept comes back um, for that for that floggy request and then there's a port login and so so the first login the the floggy itself is getting that fabric addressed. Um, Okay, that that FCID back, and then the port login is is the hey, I need to register for the for the name service, right? And so you can accept back to that, right? And then you say, okay, I would also like to know about state changes that go on in the fabric. Okay, we can tell you about state changes, right? And then register attributes with the name server. Are there are there particular characteristics about about the device that um, that need to be registered with the name server? And then the query for devices is hey who am i allowed to talk to right and so the the the, the accept back from that lets you say hey you know there's there's um, you know there's names there's a name server a, a phone book you can look up now you know the, the interesting thing about the way this works as i as i mentioned to you before is that you know if if a device is unzoned right it's it's allowed to to see other unzoned devices right it can see pretty much anything um, anything that, that that the name server will will tell it about, but um, but within a zoned environment, right? That phone book. Think of it like a restricted phone book, right? You're only allowed to know about people. You know, if you think about your mobile phone, you're, you 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 can only dial people that that are in your contact list, effectively. Okay, and so those is first going to log to the to the well known um, name service address. Right, and it's going to register that what it's supporting. Right, so it supports SCSI or the Fiber Channel Protocol. It could also um, say, and I think Ed's, uh, Ed's example later on is uh, FC NVMe2. So it could say that it supports FC NVMe2 or both, um, because an HPA can actually support both uh, both both technologies. Right, and and is an initiator. Um, and it's going to register for for certain FC4 types. So remember, FC4 is the is the protocol um, that's that's being supported there. So um, it's uncommon for you know for devices to to include 
you know, PyCon and other things. So it might register as a, as a mainframe, as a PyCon uh, platform, or as a SCSI platform, or an Indie pla NVMe platform, or an, a, a SCSI and NVMe platform, but you, you get the idea. That's, that's um, you know, uh, that's how it registers the services that it, that, that, that it can support. Um, and then it's going to query, hey, who am I allowed to talk to? Who's in my phone book, right? And that um, get port IDs by, by feature type is, is basically going to going to be the, the query to say, hey, in my phone book, tell me, you know, tell me who I'm allowed to see. And then FCNS is, is going to tell the host back, hey, you can communicate in this case with FCID uh, 011F00, right? And that's one example of how that host at um, FCID 010400 finds out that it can talk to that particular storage port, right? Is through that um, through that query. Hey, now, uh, uh, we have a question that maybe you should answer at the end of this. Uh, it's a question, I think it's about not just FCNS, but also like the discovery and uh, and the flogging notifications. But does all this happen without us noticing? Do we need to manually configure? So is all are all the things that you two have covered so far things that pretty much happen automatically when you plug a node into the fiber channel fabric, or, or do any of these require manual configuration? Yeah. So interestingly enough, um, one of the one of the fun things about the fiber channel ecosystem is is that things are very and and you know Ed kick me in the knee if I get this get this wrong in any way, but but you know things are very well uh, tested and very well supported across the entire ecosystem. So all the storage vendors and all the HBA vendors and all the all the server vendors and the operating system environments get tested and qualified against against uh, all the all the platforms. And and the uh, that's a long answer to a it's pretty much going to happen for you automatically. You don't have to configure it. You connect the 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 cabling between the, the server uh, the HBA and the server and the and the switch and the and the, the and it is HBAs on the front end of the of the storage base as well. They use the same um, basic HBAs um, in in the vast majority of those. I think there's only one storage vendor that does their own um, and and connect those up. And these these fabric logins and and port logins are going to happen um, very much automatically. Now the zoning configuration, yeah, that's that's done. Um, you know, in a in a you know in a very defined, very deliberate manner, right? Because you're going to decide, you know, who gets to talk to who um, in the environment, or I guess who gets to talk to who in the environment, um, you know, in in that scenario. But and I think that's a that's an accurate descriptor. Yeah, I would say there is some control that you can have. Like, let's suppose you didn't like the domain, the first byte of the FCID being zero one. You can you can set the domain in your switch for the yeah. devices. And there is various uh, configurations that are available, but for the most part, this stuff is just happening under the covers and uh, you don't have to do anything to make it happen. Yeah, in fact, I think one of, one of the things that most frequently happens is, uh, as Ed said, you know, it's, it's almost a fire and forget topology. People, people just, you know, depend on it sitting there, sitting there taking over. The, the point that Ed makes about setting domain IDs, yeah, in particular, if you're setting up several small environments that you have a later concept that you want to merge them together. Um, if you if you discreetly uh, provide unique domain IDs to all of the switches, when you when you then um, connect those um, those switches together, um, you you don't end up uh, having to reset anybody's uh, domain address. And so you, you can actually merge uh, environments down um, down the road in a non-disruptive fashion if you choose to. So uh, I, did that answer the question, John? I definitely think it did. So please, there's a, one other question, but I'll have that one wait until later. So please go on. OK. okay. Um, so with the storage, and this, and this time the label is correct, the, with, this, with the storage login, right, um, the, the port login comes across from the, from the server, <coughs> excuse me, to the, um, to the storage element, which is going to accept um, that that login and the process login comes back across, saying, "Hey, um, you know, I want to be able to 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 query you for um, in 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 an FCP environment or or sorry, fiber channel protocol environment where it's a SCSI. Um, you know, maybe a link query. Tell me that tell me that the uh, the the elements that are that are behind you on this inquiry, right? So you'll respond back with what are the what are the targets that are supported underneath it, right?" 
Um, and that's what then allows the, the follow-on conversation um, that Ed's going to describe to you around post-target I.O. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, we're getting pretty close to the end of this. Uh, as you can see, we've um, we've taken you through like speed negotiation, even you know the fact stuff that we do to ensure that we can uh, process things at these faster rates without uncorrectable errors. We've talked about logging into the fabric, querying the fabric. We've talked about zoning. We've talked about some flow control. We've talked about how uh, devices get the information about other devices in the fabric. And, we, and AJ just talked about how the end-to-end -end communication actually happens between the host and the target to set things up. And once that's all done, and there's there's other things that have to happen uh, as well, uh, like querying the, the LUNs, the logical data stores that are inside the targets and stuff. But but in basic, you know, all that information, all that all that processing happens uh, between the hosts and the targets. And that's all done, hopefully, so that at some point in time, some real I.O. will happen. I mean, that's the goal of this whole thing. That's why we have fiber channel. That's why we have, you know, fiber channel switches. That's why we have hosts and targets, these monster storage arrays that hold, uh, you know, the same amount of information that, that the whole human race produced uh, for the first 2,000 years, uh, you know, last 2,000 years, it can hold in one refrigerator-sized uh, uh, container. But we're, we're at at some point in time, there's going to be read and write I/O. And how does that really happen? So these are very simple kind of uh, diagrams here. But basically, there's a read and there's a write. So a read means the host is requesting data from the target or the storage array. And a write means the host is transmitting data into the storage array or target. So a read is as, as seen here on the screen, it's fairly simple in its basic structure. As uh, AJ mentioned before, we had this, this right here describes one exchange. And if you looked in the fiber channel header, there would be one OX ID or exchange ID and one RX ID that would that would map to this. Now, inside of that exchange, there's going to be some multiple sequences, but um, the initiator just sends out a, a SCSI read, for example, it could be an NVMe reader. Really, this is this structured the same, and inside that read is a size and a location, a block location of where it wants the data based upon the file system that it's that it's dealing with. And that size can be small, you know, 2K or maybe even less, but it, or it can be big. Uh, and as we talked about earlier about uh, having multiple targets sending in data at the same time and stuff, in general, it's not a good idea to request megabytes of data in one SCSI read or one read command at a time. But the size is really, could be very large. And the target gets that read command and he chews on it for a little bit. He gets his data ready and stuff, and then he basically blasts it back to the initiator uh, at pretty much at, at the speed that it can send. And you see there, in this case, the read is composed of multiple data frames, and each one of those would be an increasing block number inside of the uh, inside of the, the the LUN, the data store. And then once the target sends the last one, it sends a status message to the initiator indicating it's done and it was successful in the recommand. So the recommand is fairly simple and it's very structured. The uh, initiator asks for data, the target gives it the data in multiple uh, fiber channel frames. Once it's done, the status message is sent. If there was some problem with delivering that data, then the status message might have some kind of an error or something, uh, uh, completion in it and stuff. But um, but generally speaking, the status is going to be you know okay, a success, and the data then is going to be transported by the SAN and whatever arbitrary topology that's there that's really you know unknown to the initiator and the target themselves. And then we move on to the the right. IO flow. And the right IO flow is a little bit more complicated than the read. Uh, but again, you can see that the initiator is sending the command. That's why he's called the initiator, because he is the one initiating both the reads and writes to the to the target. And he issues 
a write command. And again, this has got a size and a block location and stuff with it. And But now the target's in a little bit more controlling of a position here. The target can say, well, I either like that size or don't like that size. Uh, he can say, I, I'll, I'll send back what's known as a transfer ready. And inside that transfer ready, there's a burst size. And the burst size could be equal to the total size, or it could be something less than the, the total size, depending upon what the target really wants to do. If it's a really a large uh, write command, then the target might say, I, I want to send it to you in multiple, uh, multiple sequences. And he'll send a, a transfer ready with a smaller burst size. And then once he sends that transfer ready, that's basically a data solicitation request from the target to the initiator. The initiator then sends the data that's, that fulfills that burst size. If, the, if that burst size was less than the total size, then the target, once it's ingested that data, it would then go ahead and send another transfer ready with another burst size. And the initiator getting that would then go ahead and, and transfer more data. This might happen, you know, normally it doesn't happen a lot back and forth, but it can happen one or two times. And then typically all the data is transferred from the initiator to the target. And at some point, once the target has gotten the last sequence of data based upon the last transfer ready, it will transmit a status message indicating everything's okay and the data has successfully been, been received by the target. So these two flows are really the result of all the other processing that happened along the way. That's what this IO happens, uh, which is really the goal of the entire fiber channel SAN. And it really comes down to these two main IO operations, typically, uh, that that is the reason for the SAN. These are the data movers inside the SAN. Okay, so that's a, a pretty a pretty wide, but not necessarily deep uh, overview of uh, how hosts and targets communicate. We can see the fiber channel, you know, the transport provides uh, it's a purpose-built uh, transport for SCSI and NVMe I/O. In fact, uh, AJ and I were talking about it when NVMe came out a few years ago. It just worked across the fiber channel network because we had all of the capabilities that uh, NVMe needed. It's a very high performance. It's very low latency. It's lossless typically. Instead of you know, in case of errors or you know, link failures or stuff or, or extremely bad behavior by somebody in the sand, it's generally lossless. It's easy expanded. If I have a sand of five switches and I need more capacity, I can basically plug a switch in anywhere now and and achieve a higher capacity now there is definitely best practices involved there but but for the most part the uh, topologies are arbitrary and uh, and it's easily expanded and it's feature rich a lot of these features these services the name server the F port server and stuff which is kind of like a DHCP server these are all just built into it you they, they're there they're under the covers and they and they simply work uh, fiber channel flow control equalizes the received data with the transmitted data in a very efficient way without dropping any frames. And initiators can communicate with targets without even knowing the underlying topology in the SAN. So given all of these features here, you know, I'm sure everyone is agreeing that fiber channel is the networking topology of the future. So that's pretty much what we have. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so I do, I do want to just just have one item there on the on the um, you know when when Ed talks about feature rich and easily expanded, the simplicity that he's describing is is real. You can you can drop a switch into an existing fabric, and it will learn the topology. It will learn the name service registration. It will learn the zoning services. It will learn everything from the existing fabric. And so, literally, that you don't you don't configure it. You know, it, it will it will it will pick that up. It's that's that's part of the distribution. So it's very different than than other topologies where you might spend hours or or a half a day, you know, configuring the next switch that you want to drop in and, and making sure that you don't create problems for anybody else. So it it you know it, it's it's funny how um, to me people occasionally talk about fiber channel as if as if it's you know some somehow difficult to do. And I don't want to make it sound like like you don't have to pay attention. It's a lot simpler than most people think. Ed. 
Yeah, yeah, there are some problems, and that's why I have a job. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but still, for the most part, yes, it, these things do work, and it's fairly simple with a lot of stuff handled under the covers. So I think I think that's it, John. Okay, very interesting. Actually, we we are just have one. Uh, oh, look, there are two questions. So let's try to get squeeze those in. Let me uh, just say that I would like to let everyone know that we did record this. So this will be available for replay with the slides. The slides, if uh, will be available for download as well, if they're not available already. And uh, Q, and then any questions we don't get to, or actually probably the questions we do get to, will be published in a blog afterwards. So. One of the questions is, I think about the uh, credit system, is there any fabric notification feature for these back pressure events? And I assume they're asking if uh, you run out of credits or if you overwhelm, if several uh, hosts overwhelm one target or several targets overwhelm one host, is there a fabric notification feature for that? I'll go ahead and take that. So in general, there really isn't. Uh, however, in, in the recent specifications, they're really still under development, there are some fabric performance impact notifications there to there. So the goal going in the future is that there will be some notification mechanisms that will be in place to notify when certain links or devices are congested. And it, it just, just to add on that a little bit, they, I think the advantage of that is that, that we now engage the ecosystem in dealing with the congestion. So you can send us a, a state uh, an, an impact, a fabric performance impact notification to an HBA and say there's a link integrity on this link, pop the MPIO stack and use the alternate path until this link is, is re-verified. So there's, it's the, the, the FPIN stuff is, is, is new, yes, but it's, it's already very, very um, useful in the, in the environments. Okay, great. And one other question, has the FSPF stuff always been there or is there a minimum speed or a certain generation of fiber channel where it was introduced? Also, how is the FSPF, uh, which I think is shortest path, uh, determined? Is it just by shortest path or does it also take into account uh, the speeds of the switches? And that could mean bandwidth or could mean latency or busyness of the switches along the path. Uh, so, AJ, I mean, go ahead if you want to take it. I mean, I've only been around the fiber channel world about 12 years. And as far as I know, it's been <laughs> so yeah. maybe at yeah. some point in time it was introduced. But as far as I'm concerned, it's always been there. Yeah. So, so we we got 20 coming up on 25 years with it. So, so fabric shortest path first is 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 in all the switches. It's in all the topologies. Um, it does just work. You can you can do interesting things around assigning weights links to make them um you know to to basically make them look shorter right um so so there are things you can do around that but but that's a very manual process the normal mechanism is it is literally just shortest path first okay great and looks like we're starting to run out of time on our talk here but uh another question is what are typical latencies for uh end to end i think it's node to node port and node to fabric to node uh, so what's the latency if it's just node to node direct or node to node with one switch in between? So five, five, uh, five microseconds per kilometer of, of optical cable <laughs> is, uh, is, is, you know, sort of the latency on, on, on links. Individual latency in terms of, of switches, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in the very low microseconds level, even on, even on the director platforms. Um, that I'm that I'm aware of. Um, I know that that some of the arrays, you know, software on the on the hosts and on the arrays is going to be more of the the delimiting factor. I know that some of the NVMe arrays are now sub 100 microseconds um, in terms of of response across the array controller. Um, but again, it's it's going to be software stacks on on the on the host and on the initiator. The the actual switches and optical cabling is negligible. Okay, so it sounds like just the physical parts for the switches and the, as you said, the cabling, it's in the low single digit microseconds, but then if you look at, add the software latencies at the host and the target, that could put it in the, you know, make it higher because it adds some time. At the risk, at the risk of annoying my software colleagues, software is always the hard part. 
<laughs> all right very good all right this is uh so i know we're over time but i just want to squeeze another good question that's coming uh is it a best practice to have all ports in the system to run at the same speed uh, i.e we have storage connected at 32 gigabit fiber channel and we have hundreds of clients with 16 gigabit interfaces uh is this going to make the switches job easier or harder i'll jump in on that I, in general i think that's an impossible dream with a SAN of any size, it's very difficult to have everything exactly at the same speed. And the fiber channel flow control, the buffer to buffer credit flow control couldn't really handle it. But it, but even if you have everything at the same speed, that doesn't mean you still can't cause problems by what we talked about earlier with eight targets all transmitting to one host at the same time. So in general, the closer you can bring your speeds together, certainly the better. Uh, but fiber channel doesn't really require absolute uh, identical speeds throughout the fabric and the and the flow control really mechanism really can can help equalize that if there are congestion issues that come up then those those would need to be investigated and the individual circumstances need to be handled yeah okay i, I agree i think that the reality is that every customer i've ever seen in in multiple decades has multiple generations of servers and storage in every environment. It doesn't matter whether it's Ethernet, fiber channel, and fit band, take the Yeah, it's a good point. Good point. That's definitely true. The bigger the network, the, the more impossible it becomes to keep everything at the same speed. All right, we are out of time. In fact, we're five minutes over our allotted time. I'd like to give a big thank you to both Ed and AJ for a great presentation. Thank you to everyone who attended. I apologize for if we had some uh, garbled audio or noisy audio at the beginning or for the first half of the webcast. Uh, any questions that we didn't get to, we will answer in the blog. And we do ask for all of you who are on, so if possible, rate this webcast and give us your feedback. What did you like? What could we do better? Uh, what did you think? And, you know, should we? Are there other topics you'd like to see webcasts on and so forth? Okay, so um, then we have another question that came in. We are, do not have time, unfortunately. So again, we'll answer those questions in a blog that we'll publish on the SNEA website. Again, thank you everybody for attending. This is your host and moderator, John Kim, signing off. And we look forward to seeing you on the next SNEA webcast. You can see the previous ones, uh, and you'll be able to see a replay of this one in the SNEA Educational Library at the SNEA website. Thank you very much, everyone. This will now end our, conclude our webcast for today.